Okay, so welcome everyone to our kickoff event for Earth Week 2014 here at UIS. Um, for those of you that are on social media, we're asking you to please post to let everyone know that you're here and use the hashtag MyUSLife and UIS Earth Week. So help us trend. We're trying to show everyone that our campus is committed to becoming greener by facilitating critical thinking discussion and action on pressing environmental issues. So tweet, Facebook, Instagram, use all those other sites that I don't even know about, um, and hashtag this stuff. So um, my name is Megan Stiles, and I'm an assistant professor of environmental studies here at UIS, and I'm also the co-chair with Dathan Powell of the Sustainability Committee here at UIS. And we've been working hard to bring you guys an exciting lineup of events to help us celebrate Earth Week, and Earth Day itself is actually this Wednesday. So tonight, I'm pleased to introduce our Earth Week kickoff speaker, Dr. Kyle White. Kyle holds the Timnick Chair in the Humanities in the Department of Philosophy at Michigan State University, and he's a faculty member in the Environmental Philosophy and Ethics graduate concentration. His primary research addresses moral and political issues concerning climate policy and indigenous peoples, and the ethics of cooperative relationships between indigenous peoples and climate science organizations. He is an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. His articles have appeared in many prestigious journals, including Climatic Change, Environmental Justice, and Hypatia. Kyle's work has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Northeast Climate Science Center, and a number of other institutions. And he's also involved in several innovative initiatives that bring diverse groups of stakeholders together to work collaborati collaboratively on issues of environmental justice, climate action, and food democracy. He was recently appointed to the Department of the Interior's Advisory Committee for Climate and Natural Resource Science, and he hopes to play a major role in instituting some of the reforms and the suggestions that he'll share with us tonight. So after the talk, please stay with us for a short question and answer session, and then we're also gonna have a catered reception in the lobby. And you should have gotten a form. We're trying to assess the success of our Earth Week programming this year. So please fill out that form um, to help us figure out whether or not the speakers that we're bringing in are engaging you and fitting your interests. And uh, leave that for us, if you please, at the table outside where you checked in for Eche. So um, please fill that out for us. So I'm going to introduce um, Dr. White in just a second, but I think there's a few hanger-ons on the end. So feel free. There's plenty of seats here in the middle um, if people need seats. Wait, but then it wouldn't be standing room only. It wouldn't be standing room only, yeah. So don't, don't, don't be shy. There's, there's places you can squirrel in over here. Maybe you just you know, want to hang out. That's cool. <laughs> OK, so without further ado, I introduce Dr. White. <laughs> Bonjour, how's it going? I wanted to thank the philosophy department and environmental studies for hosting me and for thinking of having me out to this event. Really looking forward to chatting with you all and to the rest of my time here on campus learning about this institution. One question I have, is this whole campus connected by underground corridors? <laughs> Not quite, because I came down underground. I thought I saw like a little passageway that was going into another building. I thought, man, that'd be really cool if like the whole thing was like totally networked with underground tunnels. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> But anyway, so I wanted to start off in the talk. I have a ton of stuff to cover because it's sort of a presentation that's a synthesis of a whole bunch of different things I've been working on. I'm going to try it out with you all here. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about who I am and my work. So oftentimes when I talk to folks, they're not familiar with the context that I work in. And I'd like to shift into the main uh, part of the talk. So in terms of like the kind of work I do, I'm an enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And if you've never heard of Potawatomi people, you should have, because actually Springfield <coughs> is a significant part of the continent for us. Uh, in 1838, my ancestors were forced to march from our homeland in the Great Lakes region down to Kansas and eventually into Oklahoma. And guess what was one of the places that we passed through? Springfield, and there's even this plaque here that talks about how when we came through this area there was a huge parade and the people in Springfield got a chance to see native people which evidently if you read what it says wasn't something that they were too terribly familiar with and then we made our way down further south and the, that plaque is 
you guys recognize this building, right? Yeah, it's on evidently somewhere like on the side of that building or around next to it. So this is actually a significant place for me, but this is where we ended up in, in Oklahoma. And this is kind of what the land looks like uh, where the citizen Potawatomi Nation is, our, one of our buildings. <clears throat> but what I really love and what my work is about is living in the land where we actually originally came from and where Potawatomi tribes still live today. So Michigan, Ontario, Wisconsin, you know, this was our original territory. So I've really devoted my life to the protection of the Great Lakes region, to the waters in the Great Lakes. This is the landscape that I love, though I value greatly the area and our territory in, in Oklahoma. It's really the Great Lakes region where my passion is. We're a woodlands tribe. I, I tour all over the Great Lakes. I work on educating people about the lakes and about the environment. <clears throat> and you guys know what this is. It's one of my favorite things. One thing we have in the Great Lakes, this is actually wild rice. And I've done a lot of work as well to protect water and especially indigenous women's role in the protection of water as well. I do a little ricing and other harvesting activities myself because these were the things that were part of our culture and still are to this day. I'm also involved in a number of other environmental justice issues that connect to other groups outside of indigenous peoples. I am one of the founding members of the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. We look at a number of different issues, uh, you know, from pollution in Detroit to fracking issues to issues affecting numerous populations throughout the state in relation to the environment. We host big dialogues to try to change policy on environmental justice in Michigan. We recently in the fall had a Michigan statewide environmental justice. So I'm also plugged into stuff that other folks are doing. I'm a big fan of if you ever have an event, it's gotta be well catered with local food, food that's good to eat. So that's a big part of what I do is pick and plan menus and things like that. In terms of my job at uh, Michigan State University, what I've really tried to do is, is, is make sure that as, as a professor, it's really tribes, you know, tribes as the default sovereigns in this land, tribes as the main governments that influence my work. So when I think of what I do in the university, I'm a professor and even though Part of my pay comes from the state government and from federal sources and so on. I'm also influenced and accountable to the tribal nations. And for those of you who don't know, there's 566 federally recognized tribes in this country. And there's numerous other tribes that aren't recognized. There's tribes that are recognized just by states. So I really see my work as accountable to, to these nations um, in addition to my own nation. <clears throat> One of the things, given I'm a philosopher and I primarily work on ethics, and some of you might not understand these comics if you're not familiar with Indian issues, um, but feel free to laugh if you do understand these things. Um, part of what I do is focus on external issues that tribes face. So that is, I focus on understanding how is it that tribes can best live with non-tribal folks, so the settler population, the US population. Because if you know a little bit about history, we've been through quite a bit with these other groups. And so part of what I try to figure out is, are the ways that other groups treat us ethical? And what are things we can do to try to change how we're treated? And what are things we can expect them to do to change how they treat us? But I also look at internal issues as well. Like any community, tribes face ethical issues. We face issues about whether to invest resources in rekindling our culture versus investing resources in short-term jobs. We have all sorts of philosophical debates about metaphysical issues and issues of ultimate reality and issues of social justice. And these are all internal issues as well that we argue about. We have our own political issues and so on. So part of what I do is also deal internally with issues that we face as tribes. It's as part of my goal overall of being a philosopher that serves the tribal community and not just a philosopher that serves the state community or the US community. <clears throat> In this capacity at Michigan State, I formed a research group that was mentioned in the introduction. So this is a research group that people like me, they work on environmental ethics, and it's a group of philosophers and other theorists, and we have a lot of fun. This image probably confirms every stereotype you have about how philosophers do research. Uh, <clears throat> 
but what can I say? It's part of our scientific method. <laughs> Show that to your science professors and say that you got some research done. Um, another passion of mine on the educational side is getting tribal college students more involved with the sciences and empowering tribal college students to participate in indigenous sovereignty and indigenous resurgence. So I'm part of a lot of groups that seek to work with tribal college students to build leadership and to build capacity to influence science. <clears throat> I've been active in the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group, which is a group that seeks to increase the involvement of tribal students in climate science. They just recently had a meeting where there was a number of presentations about tribal college students working on, on, on climate science issues. Uh, I also host meetings uh, at Michigan State involving tribal students in Michigan to get them more involved in policy issues and science issues. Um, I know it looks like it's all about business, but we do get a little bit crazy. <laughs> but that's the fun part of working this capacity. In terms of my research, I sort of categorize what I do in two areas. The first area I work with is, I call it knowledge sovereignty and indigenous planning in relation to climate change. So this is the area where I really try to do is increase respect within scientific communities for tribal knowledge and to also increase tribes' capacity to use science to support their self-determination and sovereignty. I've published papers, I've published guidelines. This is one of the projects I'm part of called Guidelines for Considering Traditional or Indigenous Knowledges and Climate Change Initiatives. This is part of a group that I helped to found called the Climate and Traditional Knowledges Work Group. And my work in knowledge sovereignty is translated into my doing a number of workshops and trainings and so on for people in climate science about how best to work with indigenous peoples. I'm part of another group called the Rising Voices of Indigenous People in Weather and Atmospheric Science. We're trying to increase the involvement of indigenous people in the climate science area. This is from last year's meeting. These were some of the attendees who also work in this area. <clears throat> I also have a really active relationship going with the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation. I spend a lot of time up there and have numerous projects that seek to do two things, both improve tribes capacity to work with scientists to engage in climate change adaptation planning, but also to host dialogues that connect scientists with folks in tribes so that they can best learn how to work together. Uh, the Sustainable Development Institute at Menominee is very cool. It has its own tribal model of thinking about sustainability. Uh, after the talk, we can discuss this a little bit more. It's an interesting way of thinking about sustainability. Uh, we also do a lot of direct adaptation planning with tribes. So we host workshops within tribes about how to pay for, or how to not, well, part of it's how to pay for climate change, but how to plan for adaptation to climate change. This is one of the workshops where we piped in uh, scientists to work with a particular tribe. I always try to get outside to see the regions that I love as well. This is Red Lake. Um, it's one of the biggest lakes in North America. It's beautiful. We also host events to build dialogue with scientists and tribes. This is one we recently hosted in the fall at Menominee Nation. If you've never been out there, it's a beautiful place. It's not too far from what most people call Green Bay. We do really fun stuff at these events. We've got you know, drum groups and ceremony and introductions. Uh, this is one of the dialogues I hosted to connect tribes and scientists. Um, so a lot of what I do is facilitate these fairly difficult discussions. Uh, I don't fall asleep when elders are speaking. <laughs> and when people get a little bit out of hand, I just start telling people what to do. I'm not a very good facilitator. I'm kicking that white guy out. <clears throat> the other area I work with, I kind of call climate policy. So this is where I actually try to improve the way in which the US legislature, the way in which the executive branch and so on affect tribes in terms of allocating budgets for tribal adaptation. In terms of addressing issues such as how climate change affects treaty rights that are important and matter to indigenous people as legal instruments. So one group I'm part of is called the First Stewards Symposium. It is a group that meets about every two years to try to change climate policy toward tribes. It's a lot of fun. Native people from all over the US sphere come and attend. 
I'm always trying to figure out this picture because those two people there are looking that way. And then the two people next to me are looking straight down at their notes. And I'm just looking to God knows where. Um, so I've never been able to figure out the dynamic in that picture at all. I've published a lot of articles on climate policy issues. So one of mine, Justice Forward, looks at a number of policy hurdles and suggestions for improvement that tribes face. And like I was talking about before in my stewardship activities, I work on a lot of issues in terms of indigenous women's environmental advocacy. So I have articles to talk about indigenous women's work on climate policy. I also have done some pretty boring legal stuff. This is a recent document that we're about to finish called Tribal Climate Change Principles, which is actually directed toward executive branch and the US legislature in terms of how they could improve what they're doing. Uh, to benefit tribal adaptation efforts. So that's a little bit of a gloss of the work I do to give you an idea of the context that I, I work in and the sort of values I have and the sorts of goals that I have in my work. Now the topic for this talk is really one that I've been thinking about a lot because in the world of climate change, a lot of times we get sort of, you know, thinking in a certain direction and we ignore certain things that are really cr critical to climate change. And in one of these areas that I'd realized I'd probably ignored for a while, which as you'll see by the end of this presentation is kind of weird, uh, is, is food. And so this, you know, coming out here was really an opportunity for me to connect the work I'd done on food with the work that I've been really passionate about for some time on climate change. And also a chance to share with you guys just a lot of work that native people are doing around climate change and, and food as well. Uh, for audiences in places like Illinois, Illinois doesn't have any federally recognized tribes, so I'm not sure how much uh, that many of you engage with tribal issues, so it's a great opportunity to share what tribes are doing. In terms of climate change and conservation, tribes take tremendous leadership. Indigenous people are, are major movers and shakers in the world of environmental advocacy. So. Earth Day, you know, is, is, is very important for reflecting on the leadership of Native and Indigenous people in conservation, environmental stewardship, environmental advocacy, uh, reforms to the food system, and, and so on. <clears throat> so how did I get interested in this topic for this lecture? Well, it came when I was thinking about how these three areas sort of fit together. <clears throat> so I was thinking about climate justice, anthropogenic climate change, we're all just call anthropogenic change for here, this notion of responsibility and food systems reform. So, so what do I mean by each of these three things and how do they relate to each other? So first of all, when we're talking about climate change, and many of you have probably seen or heard something like this before, what we're really just referring to plain and simple is the fact that we've fairly recently been able to document that there is a rise in global average temperature. So this is a long-term change. And the rise in global average temperature is not something that you can see necessarily, but it is something that at the end of the day could destabilize the climate system and make it so that the patterns of environmental change that we're used to seeing or we expect to see will be different. And so climate destabilization could lead to a number of different kinds of impacts such as increased frequency of extreme weather events, changes in water levels, and so on. So you can see here some of those things are discussed. And when we talk about these impacts, we're talking about things that we'll experience 30 years from now, 40 years from now, even thinking further out 100 years from now. And one of the reasons why this is very significant to us is because historically, over time, the climate has always changed. But the types of climate changes that I referenced back here, these are ones that we're pretty sure are driven by things that humans do, or humans did historically. So burning fossil fuels through industrial activity puts greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That creates the rise in global average temperature, which then destabilizes the climate system. Deforestation, when you deforest, that has an implication for releasing emissions into the atmosphere. 
when you engage in massive forms of land use, such as clearing land for certain kinds of agriculture, that is an implication for climate change. So we know that the drivers of climate change, and this is why we call it anthropogenic, anthro in terms of human, they're things that humans do, they're things that humans did. And this makes it a huge moral issue, it makes it a, makes it a justice issue, because what if I'm one of the populations that actually has to pay a pretty heavy cost because of one of these changes? So this is a, uh, a, a sort of visual that shows that it happens to be the countries that are already uh, struggling with issues of, 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 of nutrition and food security, so having enough good food to eat, are also the ones whose food systems are gonna be potentially most affected by climate change. And so the idea there is if I'm a population that's gonna be affected in the negative by the sorts of climate change impacts I talked about, and somebody else's activities are responsible for it, hmm, what does that mean? It means it's their fault. And we should figure out some way for that group to remedy that situation. But what makes climate change particularly tricky is that it's not just a one-to-one -one sort of thing where I put emissions into the atmosphere and those emissions strike somebody down. It doesn't work like that. It's very complicated because a lot of the impacts that we might see today or in the future are based on emissions and activities that people did several generations ago or longer. Or it's also the case that if I drive my car, those emissions go up into the atmosphere, they mix and head somewhere else. So it's not like you can actually figure out, well, these you know, groups, emissions and so on, you know, impacted this particular group. And the climate system itself is actually very confusing. It's not really something that you see. You don't actually see the climate system. You see the weather, but you don't see the climate system, right? These factors here are not things that you can sort of identify or are aware of. So it's very mysterious and it's something that we don't fully grasp what it is. So to suggest that somebody uh, is harming somebody else through the climate system brings up all sorts of confusing issues that really push us to the limits of, of, of what we know. That's what I call the issue of responsibility and motivation. So even if we know that the climate's changing and people are gonna be harmed and affected by that, it's very hard for us to get motivated to do something about it. It's very hard for us, especially living in countries that industrialized and contributed heavily to climate change, it's very hard for us to change our lives in ways that could affect people in the future. And so this is why we call it climate justice, because the issue of figuring out what's the fair thing to do, given that people are definitely be harmed, there are people who are likely already facing vulnerabilities and harms through other factors, and for especially people in industrial countries, what is it that we can do in response? What is it that we can do to help remedy these things? Now, when we think of some of the key questions within climate justice, these are some of the key ones that I think of. So how do privileged people reduce their carbon footprint? We often call this climate change mitigation or the issue of dealing with climate change drivers. Another issue, who will compensate harmed populations? This is often referred to as adaptation. And a third question, what is morally required of industrial countries to establish global collective action to address anthropogenic climate change? So is it that countries like the US that benefited heavily from burning fossil fuels, do they have a special responsibility to cut their emissions uh, so that poorer countries or countries that benefited less from industrialization will have less impacts on them in the future? So these are sort of classic climate justice questions and they deal with all sorts of issues about what kind of car you drive, <laughs> about what kind of energy you use, what kind of clothing you buy, and, and, and so on. Classic climate justice sorts of questions and issues. <clears throat> now, where does this mix and come together with this idea of food systems? Well, food systems also, like the climate system, is, is very confusing, because it's one of those issues where 
your individual actions to you don't seem like they're doing that much, but really there's a whole other side to the story. So this is, I, I'm not gonna focus in on that. I'm just showing you this to be confusing, but the food system like, like the climate system is very complex and it's hard to understand you know, your choices about what to eat. It's hard to believe that all of these other decisions and policies and lifestyles and supply chains go into that. Here's a, a simpler one. <laughs> not that much simpler about all the different things that go into the food system. So food is very, very complicated as well. And I just noticed that when I talked about climate justice and the work that I was describing earlier in the presentation, that food didn't always come to mind as something that was related to climate change. And then oftentimes when I thought about food and the things that I eat and the kind of food that I support, I never really connected that to climate justice, even though they're both very, very uh, connect or com complex things that must be related in some way. And then I got really embarrassed because when I thought about how all of these things fit together, I realized that through all of my work on climate change, actually all I've ever done is talk about the connections between food and climate change. And, and a friend of mine, a scholar, Joni Adamson, reminded me that especially for indigenous people, in terms of environmental justice and climate justice, we've actually never been satisfied with the traditional environmental advocacy concepts, many of which went into the founding of Earth Day, such as wilderness protection. And we've actually always been talking about indigenous agroecological farming traditions, aka indigenous food systems, indigenous foods, ways in which indigenous people cultivate foods, ways in which indigenous people eat foods, and, and, and so on. And so that led me to really think for this lecture about all sorts of different issues about how climate change and foods are really the same sort of issue when we're thinking about what indigenous people do and who indigenous people are. So what was the actual first way that I came up with in terms of how from an indigenous perspective, climate change and eventually climate justice is related to food? Well, the first thing that dawned on me that I wasn't thinking about before is that for native people, when we think about climate change, we don't just think of it as a new thing that came about based on the burning of fossil fuels. And if you've ever seen a, a depiction of an indigenous seasonal round like this one, I don't know if you guys know what this is. I could do many, many presentations on things like this. But so th this is a way in which, uh, and this is from the, uh, the Koyukon in Alaska. My friend Shannon McNeely works with them, with her collaborators. So in, in, in this, right, this is their system of planning. This is their seasonal system of how they go about determining what to harvest, what to eat, what kind of lives they want to live, how to adapt to change. And notice if you look at it, it's broken up into different seasons throughout the year. And notice that you see different things are named after different foods. You know, so for example, you can see moose. Uh, you can see different fish. You can see you know, a number of different animals. So the idea is that this is structured in order to think about seasonal change. And people in this community track every year what's different year in and year out. And they have a long-term concept of actual climate change in the area. <coughs> but so they think about changing climate. They think about changing seasons at the same time that they think about food. So part of their primary planning activity, the way they go about making plans for the future, is a relationship between climate change and food. So it would be bizarre to talk about climate change to them in terms of just decreasing your carbon footprint, because climate change is really about how you plan for seasonal variation, how you learn from what happened in past years in order to adjust to changes that might be coming in the current year or in future years. And that's always a discussion about what you eat and what you grow and what you hunt. And many indigenous people have something like this. This is a less complicated one of uh, Anishinaabe Ojibwe seasonal round. You can see once again, the different seasons, 13 seasons, 13 moons, many of them are named after food items. And so these are all related to Ojibwe understandings of changes in climate, changes in seasonal patterns and so on. And they're all about food. This is, oops, have you you've ever seen the Smithsonian exhibit on Lakota winter counts? These were things that 
tribes are now in the Great Plains region, records that they stored of major events that happened year in and year out. And some scientists have now connected these to meteorological events that through science they can actually keep track of. And if you look in detail on these, you can see numerous things that are food issues. And so when I thought about it, I was like, well, for native people, in terms of how we've always thought about climate change, it's always been about food. It's always been based on, 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 on food issues. Now, in terms of impacts from anthropogenic climate change, many of the scientific reports that I have on the margin, such as the US climate assessment and the assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have shown us that there's a number of impacts that indigenous people are particularly vulnerably, vulnerable to and will be impacted more than other populations, especially privileged populations. And when I looked at what a lot of these impacts are, I realized that almost all of them in some way from an indigenous perspective are connected to impacts on indigenous food systems. So one of the big ones is there's about 80 villages in Alaska that have to be completely relocated because of climate change especially sea level rise. So literally those communities have their area that they're living in. They have to, they can't live there anymore. They have to move somewhere else with one community. It's around $100 million to do that. Where are they going to get the money from? And one of the biggest issues that they talk about in those discussions about relocation is the implications of changing your food system. Because the way in which you were getting food before in the first location is certainly not the way you're going to be able to get it in the next location if it's an area that you've never lived in before. And so a lot of these discussions about relocation have to do with food systems. In the Louisiana area, there's groups that are having to leave areas where they've hunted and fished to relocate to a new area because of the climate change impacts they're facing. Other issues you hear people talk about a lot are actual loss of access to foods that are culturally significant to tribes. If you're dependent on a species that you hunt, you're indigenous people, you're involved heavily in, 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 in hunting, if your tribe is along the Canadian US border, and if those animals move north, then you're not gonna be able to have access to them. So what are you going to replace? Or what if the habitat for a fish population that you depend on, it, it changes, and that fish population can no longer survive? And so when I was looking at these things, I was realizing that the theme that's common to all of these different impacts that indigenous people are, are facing is, is food. Even in these bottom three, which are social in character, those are all also about food in a lot of different ways. So for example, when people talk about intergenerational disconnection, they're oftentimes talking about situations where younger people and older people would gather plants together or hunt together. And if climate change, in the case of a, a plant that, that, that people gather for consumption, like say wild rice, if climate change destroys the habitat of that particular plant, then younger people and older people won't get together to go and harvest a plant or to cultivate the plant. And the implication there is that they won't get to know each other as much as they would have before. So it divides relationships among different generations, which is a key aspect of keeping a community together. So in all of these issues, when people talk about impacts to indigenous people, I realize almost all of these are about food in some way. And even in cases where you get native people, and here's again the example from the Koyakon, talking about what climate change means to them in relation to science, they always came back to food. So this is an example of where scientists are working with this particular community. The scientists are identifying changes, so temperature change, changes in precipitation, and then the community's own testimony talks about the significance of that. So here, it's unpredictable rainfall this season. Moose hunting season, it was really good. It was dry, but the year before, when it rained, rained in September, it usually rained in August. So they're talking about the significance of that change in terms of food. So their climate change heavily associated with food. So notice just for a second before I get to another set of examples that are more tied to climate justice, 
that whereas if you look at a lot of literature that we see in the US in an industrial country on climate change that talks about you know making sure you turn the lights off or making sure you drive a hybrid or, or those sorts of actions, you oftentimes don't see food heavily referenced. Um, but in all the cases I'm mentioning where people are concerned about climate change impacts on indigenous people or indigenous people think about the climate in terms of their way of life, food is almost always referenced. It's almost always a part of that. It's just a key part of that discussion. Now, in terms of climate justice, and so here again, climate justice advocacy referring to people that are trying to answer those three questions I talked about earlier, trying to get people to reduce their carbon footprint, trying to get rich countries to pay for the harms that poor countries are gonna face with respect to climate change, and trying to ensure that wealthy countries are accountable to the international community uh, for their carbon footprint. So in terms of climate justice movements, you actually also see food heavily involved when indigenous people are the leaders of those climate justice movements. So I wanna give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about because many people I've spoke to, they don't always see the significance of food for these sorts of climate justice issues. So here, this is the Navajo generating station and it's a major coal fire power plant. The Navajo Nation itself uh, has had a lot of struggles with the coal industry and the fossil fuel industry over the years. And native people are very upset about that and they're trying to take action to end this dependence on the fossil fuel industry and to lower the Navajo Nation's role in the production of, 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 of fossil fuel-based energy, right? And so this is the Four Corners region. But what's, what, what's interesting is when you actually look at what indigenous climate justice advocates say oftentimes about the need to shut this down, uh, it's actually based in a lot of ways on a concern they have about their food system. So this is the Diné food sovereignty, and I don't know how to pronounce Diné, but it's their term to what we usually refer to as, as Navajo, as, as outsiders. But the Diné food sovereignty plan actually talks about how one of the key reasons for fighting against the energy industry in Navajo country is because the US government over a long period of time deliberately weakened the Navajo food system so the Navajo's capacity to feed themselves without being dependent on the US to the point where the Navajo Nation is very much dependent on the short-term jobs that come from these power facilities. And so there's really not an option for the Navajo Nation to reject their dependence on these energy facilities until they can restore their food systems again. Their, their, their you know, food systems based on a number of different farming practices. They sense the Spanish in the southwest the Navajo for a long time had had an economy based on churro sheep and so on. Those were all things that the US or a number of different tactics had, had destroyed uh, through the colonization of the Navajo Nation. And so when they advocate for issues like shutting down the, the coal-fired power energy uh, development on the Navajo Nation, they're, they're keeping in mind the idea that the whole reason why there's dependence on these facilities and why the Navajo Nation continues to engage in them is because there's oftentimes not an alternative, right? In the absence of your own food system, you might have to depend on jobs from other people. And so to understand climate justice in the Navajo Nation as, as only an issue of shutting down these power plants uh, is to miss the idea that the Navajo Nation wants to have its own capacity to be food independent, to produce its own food, trustworthy, healthy, nutritious food, traditional foods. Another issue that's been getting a lot of, of press as well that is also oftentimes not associated with food uh, is all of this recent stuff around the, the sort of the new fossil fuel industry. So for most of you guys in the North America, you know, there's three major places where people are going after fossil fuel. So you have the tar sands, you've got the Bakken shale, and the Powder River coal basin. And one of the biggest ideas of, is how you ship stuff from these places to the Pacific Northwest to then sell it internationally. And so there's been a lot of people that are very upset about the you know, development of, of, of fossil fuel extraction in these regions. 
And native people have been the, at the forefront of resisting this. Do you guys know what this is? You can actually see the, the, the man camps and the towns that are developed around the Bakken Shale from outer space. It's almost like its own city, but that's like North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> And the tar sands as well in Alberta, I mean, this is, you know, horrid environmental destruction, um, which is actually, you know, related to food, led to huge uh, degradation of landscapes where certain tribes hunt that they depend on for gathering other foods and resources. So this has basically desecrated um, many areas that are important to native food systems. Uh, this is then the pipelines that they're considering building to connect these sources of fossil fuel extraction to people that would be able to use them. And then this is, for example, the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest. These are the amount of tankers that would be going through that have the potential to, to spill. At the event that I was telling you about that we host in the fall at Menominee Nation, one of the speakers, Zoltan Grossman, then was talking about native climate justice advocacy to address these issues. And what was interesting is that native folks have been very active in the Pacific Northwest to stop shipments from, from happening, to stop these places from being supplied with the technology they need to engage in fossil fuel extraction. So indigenous people have been in the forefront <laughs> of protesting these things. But one of their biggest concerns is that in the Pacific Northwest, climate change impacts have, are, are affecting the salmon population, which they depend on. Many Pacific Northwest tribes are dependent on salmon. Climate change warming affects things like stream and water temperature, which then affect the capacity of tribes to harvest salmon because the salmon populations will decline. And a concern about impacts on salmon has led them to then engage in climate justice advocacy to stop dangerous climate change impacts at the source. So the actual extraction industries that are responsible for what we're calling today anthropogenic climate change. So there's been indigenous protests from groups such as the Lummi Nation to actually block some of these shipments from being made uh, to the Pacific Northwest so they could be sold internationally. There's been a whole set of dialogues and I think a pan-indigenous treaty made to lessen the amount of tankers in the Salish Sea. There's been a massive international movement led by groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network to lobby at the international level to, 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 to lower fossil fuel emissions. So climate justice activism of all kinds in relation to uh, the development of these you know, new economies around fossil fuel extraction has actually been based on protecting food resources and, and not just reducing carbon footprint for itself. Another issue I realized was completely connected to climate change and food is where, where I'm originally from, being from an Oklahoma tribe, citizen Potawatomi Nation, one of the big issues that we faced is in, in, in Oklahoma, our land base gradually got smaller and smaller and smaller as it was taken uh, from us by efforts by the US government, by private citizens and so on. And one of the big issues we faced is that the US expected us to become farmers. But our ability to adapt and to become farmers became very difficult because many tribal members, both in my tribe but others in Oklahoma, had oil drilling that was right on their land. And I show some of these pictures, that's Eloise Cobell. She was an advocate for what uh, was discovered later on as the idea that the Bureau of Indian Affairs and others had mismanaged the revenues that were coming out of those oil drills so that indigenous landowners actually did not get as much of the profits as they were owed. And she was part of, she's passed on now, but she was part of one of the largest class action suits to get that money back for American Indians. And what I was thinking there is that the, the oil drilling actually affected our farmland, it affected our livestock, it affected our ability to adapt to the environment in Oklahoma. So there the development of the fossil fuel industry and the push to hold it accountable was related to how that industry actually affected uh, tribal farming practices and tribal lands in Oklahoma. So there the drivers of climate change heavily implicated uh, to food related issues that affected tribes in Oklahoma who were, who, tribes were relocated to Oklahoma. Another issue you see publicly where indigenous people are at the forefront of climate justice activism is the offshore drilling. 
So here, for example, in Alaska, and this is a big issue in presidential politics uh, and so on, is the idea of expanding the drilling that goes on in Alaska. But at the top of the coast are a number of boroughs that are inhabited by uh, a bunch of Alaska Native and other communities. And when you look at the different reports and things like that, what you find is what they're most uh, concerned about in these areas, right? So if you look at the top, some of those are boroughs where the predominant group is Alaska Natives. So if you look at this, right, you'll find that people are most concerned about the effects of offshore drilling on the, the, the animals that they harvest in the water, in the sea, right? So they're concerned about whales, they're concerned about other animal populations that they fish and that they harvest. And so their concern with offshore drilling is also food related. If you look, right, this was from the Inuit, Timit, or Inuit Commission to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, or Inuit Petition to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It was trying to look at impacts of climate change, so climate justice, on indigenous food systems as a human rights issue. The village of Kivalina that I talked about earlier, which is being relocated, they tried to sue Exxon and other drivers of climate change because of the sorts of impacts, many of which are on their food system, that they're gonna face. So their climate justice advocacy was heavily related to a concern about indigenous food systems. So really, if you look at all sorts of climate justice advocacy led by indigenous people, you'll find that food is almost always one of the main topics. You can't think about climate change without thinking about food. Even this international declaration, the Mystic Lake Declaration 2009 says, we recognize the link between climate change and food security that affects indigenous traditional food systems. We declare native nations and our communities, waters, air, forests, oceans, sea ice, traditional lands, and territories to be food sovereignty areas defined and directed by indigenous people according to our customary laws, free from extractive industries, unsustainable energy development, deforestation, and free from using food crops and agricultural lands for large-scale biofuels. So this is a strong international statement from indigenous people from everywhere connecting food and climate change. I also realized when I was thinking about this that work I'd already just done before on climate adaptation as an ethics person, as a philosopher, was also just heavily about food. One of the things, or one of the ideas that I've written about and I speak a lot about is that for indigenous people, anthropogenic climate change, the human caused stuff, is actually not a recent phenomena. So I talk about how for native people, our climate has been changed constantly by colonization. And I oftentimes use three examples to make that point. So one is I talk about how in areas like Michigan, woodlands tribes like my ancestors uh, were affected by deforestation. So deforestation is very similar to the sorts of changes in species and plant and animal populations that folks talk about as a future climate change impact. This was stuff happening to us in the 19th century by the settler population. That's a food issue because it ruined our forest-based uh, way of gathering food, which is why a lot of our communities had to turn to support uh, from the federal government, from non-native communities, and to engage in new kinds of practices, turning to Western styles of farming and so on. Another example I use is pollution. Uh, so this, these are the, the blue ones and the red ones. These are areas that have been hugely polluted uh, that's recognized by the US and the Canadian government. If you look up there to the St. Lawrence River, that's a major industrial channel. And the, the Mohawks, so Haudenosaunee group in that area, have been struggling with pollution for years. Their primary concern with that pollution was the effect on fish populations and the fact that they had to give up eating traditional fish populations and turn to eat food from mini marts, which if that's where you get most of your food, that's not good in terms of things like diabetes and other health issues related to the food that you eat. So pollution is an, an area where in the 19th century and the 20th century, we faced environmental change, which then just like how people talk about climate change issues in the future, we had to change what we ate, right? Native people had to change what they did. And so the Mohawk community in Akwesasne in this area had to change what they were eating because of pollution. This is another sort of anthropogenic climate change issue that's not recent. It's been around for a long time. 
And so you see, right, a lot of the rhetoric they produced around that to build awareness about the environmental problems that they were, 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 were facing there. And then finally with my tribe, right, my, my friend made a shirt for me that said, Citizen Potawatomi Nation, the original survivors of anthropogenic climate change. Um, because when we were relocated in the 1830s, we literally moved from Michigan to Oklahoma um, have you ever been to Michigan, Oklahoma? Are they the same climate? No, they're not. That was a very drastic shift. And one of the biggest things we had to deal with is the adaptation to that new food system. Another issue I've always talked about in my work as well is how climate justice issues relate to indigenous self-determination. So I've talked about how a lot of different U.S. policies all uh, skip over that, you know, like treaties, for example, the privatization of Indian lands, the reorganization of tribal governments in the 1930s to facilitate the fossil fuel industry, uh, the termination period. You know, these are all periods of, of policy affecting indigenous people. And one of the big things that I've talked about in that work is how the current policy system that we face as tribal people doesn't prepare us that well for dealing with climate change issues. You know what this is? This is a map in the Great Lakes of the major treaty areas. Those are the big colors with the years on them. One of the issues that we face is if, see the dotted line? Those are areas where tribes are able to, to fish, right, that are secured by treaty. One of the issues is that climate change is pushing those fish populations outside of the treaty area and there's no way for tribes to be able to gain access again to those fish if they're outside the treaty area or they're outside of the system of allocation that tribes have set up with the state of Michigan within the treaty area. And I realized there that with those sorts of policy issues, that's all about food, right? It's about catching fish that you eat for subsistence, uh, fish that you sell to other people. And so these issues I'd looked at with respect to indigenous climate policy were also all about food. Uh, finally, in terms of work I'd done previously, uh, I'd, I'd realized that when I talked too about knowledge issues, knowledge sovereignty issues, uh, those are about food as well because so many tribes are concerned about knowledge transfer, the idea that your grandparents will transfer what they know about how to live off the land uh, or what they know about how to adapt to certain experiences to younger folks. But a tribe I was just working with, they were telling me about how they were concerned that they were now having trouble uh, teaching and getting younger folks excited about hunting because if climate change changes snow cover and lessens it in some way, if you can't see an animal's tracks and if you take a young person out to hunt, they're not going to be that successful. And if they're not that successful in their first few hunts, they're rather going to be playing video games, right? You put on easy, shoot as many things as you want. So this whole idea of knowledge as well that I'd been working on was also heavily related to food. So in thinking about all these quick examples, uh, one of the things that I'd realized is that food systems advocacy and climate justice advocacy are the same thing. Um, and that for you, know, for you guys thinking about your lives, that there's no reason to say, oh, there's climate change and then there's food. And one of the things that I wanted to discuss um, now as I, I begin to uh, finish the content of the presentation is that there actually been some cases I'd worked with that I think combine climate justice work, climate change work, and food uh, in ways I really hadn't thought about in, in that way before that really show that they're the same thing. So take a case of a tribe that's part of the larger cultural group I'm part of. Uh, so the, the Little River Band of Odawa Indians uh, in what's now called Manistee, Michigan. So one of the things that they do is that in their tribe, as well as for other tribes in, 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 in the region, sturgeon uh, is one of the major species. It, it was a, a major species for subsistence with uh, each of these tribes. And do you guys know how big they get? They're big. Yeah, they're big fish. <laughs> And right, sturgeon, you know, kind of like uh, other fish, they like to return to the same uh, stream that they originated in to spawn. And this is the area that I'm talking about. So you can see, uh, you know, the state of Michigan there. So that's an area that used to have tons of sturgeon. The Odawa that lived in that area, they actually depended on them as a major source of sustenance, of subsistence. Uh, you can imagine that you know, fish that size could be extremely important factor in your food system. In fact, they, they joke that the sturgeon were the, the buffaloes of the, the Odawa, right? 
And so their tribe uh, exercises self-determination, self-governance today, and they're in that yellow part over there. That's the 1836 treaty area. And so that's area that within the lower part of the peninsula, they can, they can harvest in that, in that whole area. And the, the, the fish sturgeon, or what they call it, name, uh, was extremely important culturally as well. It was considered the grandfather fish. Uh, sturgeon live a long time. They can live like 100 years. And so not only are they big, but they live a long time. So they're considered to be very wise and that humans could actually learn from them. And actually, there are also people that were a Sturgeon clan. Um, and for tribes in this region, as part of my cultural groups, we have families, we have a number of other different social formations. One of the big things we have is a clan. And a clan is very important because it's about your duties and responsibilities as a citizenship, or as a citizen of that tribal group. And so Sturgeon was actually a clan. There are people who are Sturgeon clan. Um, and what happened, and this happened everywhere, is that uh, in the 19th century and 20th century, sturgeon were wiped out, um, pretty much completely wiped out with, with, with a few exceptions in the Great Lakes region. How did they get wiped out? Well, rolling logs down rivers and defacing the, you know, the side of the, the river, which can affect water temperature and other ecological conditions needed for sturgeon. Some of these pictures, by the way, aren't of uh, sturgeon casualties in Michigan, but sturgeon were wiped out everywhere. So some, if you're very perceptive, you'll see some of these are probably from like the Pacific Northwest or other, or other areas. Um, so sturgeon also was overfished. Uh, originally, uh, settler folks actually didn't value sturgeon, so they would oftentimes line them up and just get rid of them. Then they wanted them for caviar. Uh, and so they literally, they, over, they overfished them. Dams affect sturgeon's capacity to return, right, to those uh, same streams to spawn. Uh, sport fishing, so this is not fishing of sturgeon, but the <coughs> introduced species into the Great Lakes, the salmonids, um, those are known to prey upon the younger sturgeon, which puts pressure on the sturgeon population. And also pollution as well. This is outside of, um, of Manistee where the, the Little River Band is. You know, pollution is heavy too. So it's all climate change issues, right? In every single form. And because we are seeing in the Great Lakes region changes in temperature and, 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 and other things, climate change adaptation is uh, a major issue. And for the tribe, all of these things led to a decline of sturgeon, uh, which they say has actually declined um, the, the, the sturgeon clan members in the region, right? There's less of them around as there's less sturgeon around. So it's led to the disintegration of the social fabric of the, of, of, of the tribe. So in response, the tribe created a program to bring sturgeon back as a form of adaptation to all of these changes. And I call this climate change because like any community, I mean, here in, in Illinois, you certainly think about things this way, but the tribe in, in the region is figuring out, well, how are we gonna adapt to changes we know are coming in the Great Lakes region? And how do we adapt to all these other forms of anthropogenic climate change we've been through before, from over-harvesting to uh, pollution and, and so on? And they thought that restoring sturgeon, in addition to its cultural value, would be extremely important because sturgeon is the largest, longest lived, high fecundity, right, is something that actually can adapt pretty well uh, to different changing environmental conditions. So it's a good fish to have around. It's a native species. It's very adaptive. It would be a good thing to restore to deal with climate change issues. But it also had what I call integration value. And here's where the connection between climate justice, climate change, and food system will come in, is that bringing back sturgeon, that could actually make the community more aware of environmental issues that they're facing and more aware of the need to be responsible for addressing environmental change. And so how did they, they do this? Well, the first thing they did is they actually set a target. So they wanted 750 adult sturgeon in the first 25 years. And the seven generation target was to restore the sturgeon population to the levels they were before 1836 when they supported the entire Odawa population. And to do so, they brought, they made a cultural context committee, which was a group of tribal members and scientists and tribal officials to plan how they were gonna do this. And there were also people they interacted with who lived in the watershed who weren't tribal to try to plan how to restore this fish. And one of the interesting things here about the connection between food and climate change 
is that it would probably take them 70 to 100 years to restore the sturgeon population to the point where you could eat them again. Yet they still did this anyways. It wasn't a short-term decision where you restore the sturgeon population so you can start eating them next year. They're not gonna be able to eat them for a long time. So here, they were connecting food, not in terms of just something you eat now, but something that you would eat in the future. And to do so then, they found some remnant populations living in the different rivers. And they then, in order to make sure that they imprinted properly, they created a streamside rearing facility, which brought that same water through. So to avoid those little fish getting eaten out in the wild, they made this trailer, right, which would make sure that you had the same genetic population. Why did they do that? So that it's really a native species to bring back those sturgeon clan members, to make it so that people in the watershed actually became interested in having that native species. <clears throat> they created a whole program to get people to understand that to restore sturgeon, you also had to address a number of issues with the habitat. You needed to stand up against pollution so climate justice, you needed to deal with other ecological changes such as impacts on forests. They also made sure that people addressed the issue of dams and the issue of what dams do and the damage that dams do to the environment, to fish populations. And also the law enforcement objectives, right? That people need to understand that the tribe as a self-determining entity, as a government, uh, needs to be able to regulate how people treat the fishery, how people treat the environment. And so basically sturgeon restoration connected to all these areas that made people more aware of how to deal with environmental change in the region and how to address climate change issues as well. And you can see from the pictures, one of the cool things that they do, this is their cultural context group. This is the trailer where they, um, they run the water through, is they have an event that they do every year that now has about 600 people from all over the community where they actually celebrate in public um, the significance of the sturgeon for dealing with all sorts of environmental issues. So each person gets one of these buckets and you get to release one of the younger sturgeon back into the, into the water to restore the population. And the event is just awesome. Not only do people get to be educated on everything you wanna know about sturgeon, but there's ceremony, there's learning about tribal culture and other cultures that live in the watershed. People get to eat, have a good time. This is one of the tribal chairs uh, discussing music. The scientists, people from the Forest Service. It's a great event that actually brings people together in solidarity to address larger environmental issues than just sturgeon in the region. So here you see something that's actually food. So sturgeon and significance to tribes used to get people motivated to deal with, with what are ultimately climate and environmental change issues in the region, whether that's the pollution from coal-fired power plants like I showed you before, or whether that's issues of dams, or whether that's issues in how changes in water level and habitat affect sturgeon populations. So that by the end of this event, there's always some non-native person that says something like, wow, it's the power of the fish that brings us together around these issues. So that really food is a powerful vector for bringing together complex dimensions of climate justice. And so then the lessons from indigenous people and climate justice is really that when you talk about climate justice, you're really talking about all of these things jumbled together, right? They're all related together. And it's actually an artificial construct to talk about food and climate justice as completely separate things. And so what I wanted to ask you, especially the, the, the students who are here, is now that I've talked to you all about the importance of food for indigenous people in relation to climate change, you can sort of turn the question back on yourselves. You know, what's your food system? You know, how do you get your food? What do you eat? And is what you eat and your food, is that connected to your advocacy as somebody who's concerned about climate change, who's concerned about climate justice, somebody who's concerned about the environment, or are they separate? So that Earth Day actually could be something where people look at areas that oftentimes aren't associated with environmental advocacy like food. And to give you some ideas, you know, a lot of us eat food that travels a long way away and the transportation is responsible for fossil fuel emissions and for uh, you know, unsustainable forms of energy, right? How does your carbon footprint, how is that tied to what you, what you eat? 
What about the contribution of agriculture and forestry and other areas related to, 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 to food? You know, how are you implicated in that? That's related to climate change. What about the issue of your responsibility for people that are gonna be more food insecure based on climate change? We're already among those who are most food secure anyways. You know, so how do these issues then of indigenous food systems, you know, what do they translate into your lives if you're not a member of one of these communities that I have discussed? You know, how does what you eat factor into how the land is treated? Is this a climate resilient landscape? You know, that's for you to, to discuss. I mean, it looks similar to a lot of the landscapes around here. So I want to then just end by, you know, kind of asking you the question, uh, you know, how is it, you know, what is your food system? What are the food choices you make? And, you know, on Earth Day, how are those choices and how are those systems you're part of one and the same thing as your advocacy for, for climate justice and your advocacy for taking on the challenging issue of, 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 of climate change? Look forward to chatting with you guys later. mention uh, in response to that is that for you know, different indigenous <coughs> people have been in, impacted more dramatically by colonization and settlement than others. So for example, for a tribe that is relocated from like say Michigan to Oklahoma, for example, the understanding of, of plant knowledge is much different, right? Where somebody before relocation would have been able to identify hundreds and hundreds of plant species that were valuable to subsistence. In Oklahoma, you have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So there's still a concern with knowledge transmission in relocated tribes, um, but it's different from the sort of situation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. In the literature globally on this, um, communities uh, in a lot of other parts of the world, one of their primary concerns is that climate change will prevent the transmission of that valuable knowledge because, you know, say if the, if the uh, prevalence of that plant thins out so that it's harder to harvest, then the, it'll be harder to get the children and the youth involved in that. It'll even be harder to show people different examples of that, of that plant, right? So that people can really learn and understand it. So I would say that that's... Uh, one of the, the key issues, and it's both an issue of intergenerational connection, but it's also an issue of knowledge, sovereignty. Uh, groups in Alaska face this in particular because they depend on their ability to interpret and sort of read the landscape. If the landscape changes too much, then it's hard to understand how the current feel of the landscape is tied to the historic knowledge you've built up over time about what to expect in that landscape. Exactly, and that's actually why the intergenerational aspect is so critical because so much of it is oral as well that you need those interactions for the exchange of oral testimony and storytelling. Yeah, so that's a, a huge and very disturbing uh, issue that I hear about way more times than I should. <laughs> In your opinion, do you think, uh, like, like you said, the food depletion, um, all the harvesting of like the tar sand oils and all that. Do you think that America can continue to rely on a consumer-based economy if we intend to make substantial changes? Well, one thing there, um, uh, since you just act, asked for my opinion, I won't tell you the facts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but w w one of the things that I think that you see is that the you know cons and this is th actually this is my view <laughs> but um is that for it for a lot of folks in in the u.s if you just look at how you know the majority of people live i mean consuming is our culture it's part of our worldview here right um you know give me convenience or give me death 
uh, kind of thing, right? And what what I find is that <clears throat> the the it's very unrealistic to expect people would actually part from those ways because they're actually part of their culture, right? What people don't oftentimes come to terms with is that it's that lifestyle which is incompatible with the lifestyles that a lot of other groups prefer to live. For a lot of tribes, the forced adoption of an American lifestyle has not been good. If you look at the statistics, the health statistics, that as tribes have moved in that direction, they haven't benefited in the same way that other Americans have benefited. Um, so if you look at the statistics, you'll see that um, tribes are not doing as well. And so there the idea is that there could be all sorts of adaptations in American consumerism that would be acceptable as long as they no longer put so much pressure on other populations to have to buy into that and then face the consequences of the harms that one experiences. And so from my perspective, my concern has not been as much about whether ultimately uh, people in the U.S. will change on the whole, but as tribal nations, uh, what can we try to do to make small strides so that we can protect as much of our lifestyle as possible? <laughs> And so a lot of the work that I've done in the policy realm from my perspective is to try to carve out a space where our communities can lessen how bad we're affected by a lot of these issues because it's very hard to do anything that would actually change the overall way in which Americans approach food or approach the climate system. So like a lot of the dialogues that I was talking about, say, the, where we engage with scientists or people that work for federal agencies, you know, we're dealing with, say, a sp particular policy that we know if it was just adapted or changed in a certain way, that would be huge for tribes. It would make it more possible for tribes to rebuild and rekindle their food systems and deal with climate change. So I also kind of come at it from that perspective. But I don't think that anyone can really tackle the issue of how to uh, deal with consumerism because it actually is part of the American culture. It's that deep. You know, and that makes it very uh, difficult to adapt. Yeah. reflect on what we eat in regard to where it came from. So you have to have bananas <coughs> transported here from somewhere else and so forth. Um, what I see is, <coughs> to make a comment and I'll give you a question, is um, in the last 10, 20 years, our government has brought us to a place where our industries have left our, you know, continent. For example, they make jeans in Mexico, all our electronics and so forth come from China. So the policy has been to take all this industry offshore. And so what I'm saying is that if you look at that policy our government has instituted, basically, and you look at even our taxation where our money goes to Washington and then they grant it back. So the money travels back and forth, just like raw materials have to travel to China and then they come back. Raw materials have to travel to Mexico and they come back. So all that energy, the oil, the, the I, I would say is a small, it is much greater waste than say importing food, you know, from other places, coffee from Colombia, for example, fruit from. Central and South America, the off season. So, so my question to you, um, you know, with this premise is, what is the greatest waste? What cause? What has the greatest impact on the climate? In your opinion, is it waste? Is it what is it? Is it extraction of natural resources? Just out of curiosity. I think you can. We can. I mean, we can even look if we're on the. The internet. Well, I mean, even the the thing I just uh, showed, right? I mean, if you look at the um, you know the the different statistics and things like that that agencies produce and stuff like that that talk about you know like here are the different sectors that contribute most to you know anthropogenic climate change. I, mean, I think there's a lot of good 
you know, information about where we're getting things from. Like here, it's talking about uh, energy issues as predominant. Like EPA has a really good website. So I would sort of defer to what, um, you know, what folks have already sort of examined and studied about the key drivers to it. Now, with respect to food, I think the issue for, for me is not that food is a, uh, is, is say a, a predominant contributor in contrast or in comparison to some of the things that you were mentioning, but that actually people oftentimes don't think about the connections you're making if they don't think about food. You're right. You think about food, you think about the global supply chain, you think about the trans, you know, national economy, and you think, well, wait a minute, those jobs going overseas and things like that, those are all plugged into these networks and, 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 and stuff like that. So it's interesting that when I was giving that example of, um, of, of thinking about a way in which food is related to climate change, um, your question actually identified a much larger set of drivers of climate change, you know, being prompted to that example. Um, and so that was one of the sort of the points. I mean, even with um, like the Sturgeon example, um, well, I mean, at the end of the day, right, what Sturgeon does is it motivates people to think about issues that extend way beyond Sturgeon. Well, and you mentioned the buffalo. I mean, that's obvious that, you know, we did uh, basically extend buffalo for all practical purposes. So, I mean, it's, a, it's definitely there, there are issues we've got to see as realities. I, I do have a little bit of trouble making a connection between climate change and food uh, sustainability, but I mean, that's just an ongoing process. And, yeah. yeah. We can chat some more afterwards. You're not going to ditch, are you, and just take off after the Q&A? I don't know. <laughs> yes and yes. Uh, earlier you mentioned the tricky areas that are impacted by climate change, and which in turn impacted the institutions, <coughs> right? Uh, are there current efforts to adjust the tricky areas, and how does that also be <laughs> yeah, I've got a, I, I can forward it to you guys. I have a, a paper that I published um, about that issue. And one of the, the funny things is that the, so the idea that, that uh, political borders uh, are related to how people take care of the environment um, you know, it's not itself, a, you know, kind of a shocking issue. But if you look at how borders are carved up today, they don't reflect at all the dynamics of any ecosystem. You know, like why is, is you know, the U.S.-Canadian border instantiated where it is, right? You know, cutting through the Great Lakes region. Or, you know, if you look at New England with all those little states and things like that. I mean, those borders were not... Uh, you know, designed with the dynamics of those uh, ecosystems in, in mind. And treaty areas very much operate in that sense, right? The treaty area stays in the same location, but the ecosystem changes. Same with Indian reservations. Indian reservations don't move. They, they just stay there. Um, and one of the key issues, I'm going to try to say this in a few sentences, because um, if for those of you that aren't as familiar with a lot of native politics, this may be slightly, slightly confusing. But when you're talking about a treaty area, the US doesn't want the treaty area, the border of it, to be flexible. Why is that? Well, imagine if the US makes an agreement with a tribe, you can only go here, here's your reservation, here's the treaty area. And then you get US residents that buy private property you know, right up against the treaty area or in the treaty area, or even after allotment, you get US or private citizens buying land in former reservations. Um, you don't want a situation where you have to go back to your constituency and say, oh, the, the Indian treaty border changed. Um, so now you're going to have some Indian walking across your backyard or, or you know, driving a boat around your, around your property in order to adjust to climate change. 
you know, no uh, U.S. settler politician wants to be in that position. And so states like Michigan that are part of settlements to deal or the settlements of treaties, they don't want to be flexible with the boundaries. Um, and they also do not want to set criteria for flexibility that reflect tribal cultural values that they cannot understand. And so from my standpoint, in Michigan in 2020, the, it's called the Consent Decree, it's called the 2000 Consent Decree. It's the settlement that the state made with five Michigan tribes for the Lake Michigan fishery. That will be renegotiated. The current one doesn't have climate change flexibility built into it, but we're very concerned that the 2021 won't as well because the state is not gonna to wanna to bargain for that flexibility because they won't see it as in their interest. And so I would say that it's a very scary thing actually that if climate change renders the treaty rights uh, to be not that effective, that there aren't a lot of mechanisms for dealing with that. In the Pacific Northwest, they have a good document that the tribes, some of the tribes there produce called Treaty Rights at Risk, and they would like to have a renegotiation, but it, it's risky. So yeah, that's a good question, but it's a challenge that nobody has a solution for. I know I told the other people that asked about, you know, how to solve climate change, what the solution was, but <laughs> no solution to this one that I can see, yeah. You're talking about culture. Culture is huge, you know, among the tribes. Uh, they've done a lot of documentaries about how the younger generation has lost that culture. And it's more Americanized. Is that too far now? Uh, has they, have they already bridged that gap to where they can't return back to their culture? Where they, you know, they're, they're Americanized. Yeah, so I would say that... Uh, that's very relevant to the, the world that I spend most of my time in. Um, and what you find is that tribal culture as a, a phenomenon is very complicated. So, uh, for example, there's some tribes I, I work with that for years and years and years they were scattered, spread out, and in the 1980s or 1990s they were part of a reaffirmation process where the U.S. then formally recognized them as sovereign. And those tribes then are back on the land. They've gone back into their archives. They've gone back into their oral history and so on. And they've set up governments that are based on a lot of the original principles of uh, traditional knowledge and a lot of the basic uh, uh, dimensions of their culture that had been lost for a long time in terms of their daily practice. And so you find that in those cases, those tribes, and there's a lot of good literature on this, have succeeded in terms of reestablishing the livelihoods in their communities and reestablishing their sovereignty. And so, so even in cases where you have populations that really have been forced to adapt too rapidly and take on American values at a problematically rapid uh, pace, you still see people going back to those basic principles of tribal knowledge as the basis for restoring and adapting. And so that's kind of how I look at that, that issue in particular. Because I think one thing that unites us as Native people is that the while many of us are extremely similar to the settler population in a number of different ways, it's nonetheless true that that's not a viable option as a way to guide your life. <laughs> Um, because what a lot of traditional knowledge has is not just the specifics of how to live in a particular way, but the basic principles for how to live your life and how to begin again the process of living in a place and developing those relationships with the land, the plants, the animals, the ecosystems. Yeah. <clears throat> Like fossil fuel burning. <laughs> oh. Well, well, actually, this is a tough one because you've already asked a question, but then you're the organizer. <laughs> so it's like, which one? I'll have all of them. I was wondering what the question of going back, you know, how does that affect tribes these days? Because a lot of times going back can be kind of wrapped up in the centralist notion. Is that 
you're living fully nomadic or traditional lifestyle. But a lot of tribes these days also want to move forward in a way that is evolving to, you know, and you're running casinos right. now, and that's no less than tribal culture. But it depends on, and in relation to your question too. Okay, so now, now you're making me go deep into the philosophy. Um, so actually, what's what's traditional about um, about indigenous systems of governance and knowledge production is their focus on adaptivity. Like, take my tribe for example. Our traditional foods. We don't even believe they were the original foods we ate. Like wild rice um, was not an original, original food. We migrated from the East Coast to the Great Lakes and stopped where there was wild rice. Um, when I was talking earlier about uh, churro sheep in a Navajo nation, that today is considered to be something traditional, but it's actually an innovation in response to the Spanish colonization. I mean, people in anthropology and these fields you know, documented this. Now, those of us in ethics have actually argued that if you look carefully, at tribal knowledge systems. They're not actually systems of knowledge that are appropriate to a particular place and time, but they're actually principles of adaptation. They're social practices of adaptation. And so this is why actually in the climate justice world, a lot of people get, like non-native people, get really upset when they hear Alaska natives say stuff like, oh, we've always adapted. We're just gonna adapt to this. And like, what are you saying? Your whole village is gonna get relocated. Why? You know, why would you ever think that? Um, but no, from a native perspective, it's all been about adaptation. And so people don't see those principles, you know, if they go back to the land, they don't see those principles as ones that require one to recreate something that would be impossible to recreate, given how much change. There are principles that guide how you adapt, uh, how you adapt ethically and in ways that are appropriate to your culture when there's been a lot of change. Um, it's like in my community, that's how we see our traditional system, is a system of guiding adaptivity. And so tribes actually, it, it's unfortunate that one of the ways that tribes have been uh, discriminated against is through romanticization, because the idea that tribes are, are static is literally the complete opposite of what tribal philosophies actually are about. <laughs> Um, and so, so yeah, so that's kind of how I, how I, I see that. But that is actually a very... Uh, important point in my work trying to get scientists to collaborate better with tribes. A, a lot of scientists do see tribes as static. They don't actually understand that tribes, you know, a lot of the tribes I work with have a scientific and technical staff of 20 to 30 people. Doing science actually in a way that differs from how people in a university do science. Same basic idea of empirical inquiry, but performed much differently. So it's a traditional form of science, like in sturgeon restoration, you had biologists working with elders, with leaders, with community members to develop that program. It blends both principles of adaptation, you know, the responsibilities of the sturgeon clan with the biology required to bring the sturgeon back in a habitat that the traditional knowledge is no longer fully suitable for interpreting and understanding. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, doesn't that undermine uh, the advocacy for uh, if, if, if we're pursuing adaptation or uh, that's in favor of the knowledge base of indigenous people? Uh, doesn't that uh, undermine the advocacy for uh, for climate change and protecting community areas, for example? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but I might I might confuse it with the other um, issue of, of adaptation that people mentioned. But it, so adaptation is so. For example, a treaty area it is a good example of 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 adaptation because to make a long long story short, if you look at how tribes actually use treaties, they have the the so. I have to figure out how to say this in a long sentence. So as oral cultures, when tribes signed treaties, they believed that the whole negotiation process which they remembered in detail, which was actually built in a lot of flexible mechanisms, was the treaty process. It was later that they found out that actually the US just likes the piece of paper that says the different rights and stuff that you have. So what tribes have actually done is to be able to use treaties as effectively as some tribes have, they had to engage in a very principled form of adaptation to make sure that a treaty which was entirely in the Western idiom was actually supportive of their way of life 
even though the non-native population didn't understand that. So if you look at a number of areas, they are actually adaptive, but there's a difference between tribes adapting on their own terms and tribes adapting based on influence from other people. And so not all forms of adaptation are created equally. And when you see that tribes self-determine their own adaptation is a lot different from when they're forced to adapt by another group. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. White, and thanks everyone.